actually wasn't the first person to join us. Um, Trevor and Evan and Alan also participated in teams on Champions of the Flyway in, in the past few years. So we've had at least six years of Manamut participation in Champions. But we'll get to that again in a little bit. I, as, as Lisa said, I'm the Director of Tourism and Outreach for BirdLife Israel. BirdLife Israel is the uh, partner in Israel for BirdLife International. And we are part of the Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel, or SPNI from now on. Uh, it's too many words. <laughs> so um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what, what we do, and, and, and you'll see soon enough why we have this connection with management and, and what it's all about. By the way, this is our goldfinch. We were seeing oh. goldfinches today uh, that were really gold. You can see this one has a little gold. Um, and they have red faces, but that's what we call the European goldfish. Mm -hmm. So as Lisa mentioned also, uh, Israel is located right smack on the migration route between mm -hmm. Europe and Asia and Africa. And this means that hundreds of thousands or hundreds of millions, I should say, mm -hmm. birds are passing through this land bridge every, twice a year on the way back and forth on migration. And it, it makes it one of the best places in the world to mm -hmm. see birds from Europe and Asia. If you're a bird watcher and you want to maximize your dollars per bird that you see, <laughs> instead of jumping all around Europe and trying to find a bird here and a bird here, you go to Israel for two weeks in March and you'll see them all. Mm -hmm. So it's really good that way. But it, it puts us in Israel in a unique position. We are... We are the gas station, let's say, on the way, on the route of migration, the major stopover site. After they leave Israel, they are crossing the Sahara Desert, which is the, fa the fastest growing and biggest desert in the world. And there's no food along the way. So we are the last point of food in the fall before the birds cross into Africa. And in the spring, we are the first point of food after they've crossed Africa. And this puts us in a very unique position. We like to say that there are more tourists with wings than, <laughs> than with two feet um, coming through Israel. And we have a responsibility to protect the birds that are coming through our, our piece of land. We can do everything we can on our land, but we also have to reach out and work with, uh, with our neighbors because if, if the birds leave us and get shot out of the sky mm -hmm. or die of, of lack of habitat, we, we've lost out as well. So what do we do? Our birds are in a state of threat as, as most birds in, in, uh, in the world. I know that uh, America uh, ha also has seen incredible decreases in the number of birds. And why is this? Well, well, habitat loss and degradation is one of the things. Uh, Israel is a small country and we are a growing population. I think we're, we're pushing 10,000, um, 10 million, sorry. Uh, we have to put those people somewhere. And so habitat loss is a significant uh, um, issue. Climate change adds to that issue. We are also in the desert and that desert is growing. Where I live in Jerusalem, we're seeing less and less rainfall every year. And it, it is likely that soon Jerusalem will be included in the desert area if that doesn't change. So how do we work with that? Legal and illegal hunting, not so much in Israel. Uh, we don't have a, a culture of hunting in Israel, but all our neighbors, the whole Mediterranean, uh, hunting is a big part of the culture, and many of these birds are killed as they leave Israel. We see it happen on the border of Lebanon when the storks and the cranes fly over from Israel to Lebanon. We can already hear the gunshots. So we know it's happening, and so it's a, a significant issue for us. And the last one is invasive species. Um, things like miners and other invasive plants uh, are affecting the habitat. This is a, a quick view of, of, of all the birds that we have. And you can see the red, orange, and dark yellow. These are the birds that are vulnerable or endangered. Um, and I think it, it, it's about 65 to 70 species are in serious uh, um, 
decline. And you can see here our griffin vulture in the picture. This is one of the birds that uh, if you've ever been onto the Golan Heights, maybe gone to Gamla, 10, 20 years ago, there was a thriving colony of nesting birds there. Today, there are none. You have to go into the Negev Desert to see them. And they, it's just one of the examples. Most of our critically endangered are actually raptors and vultures. So what do we do? So uh, BirdLife Israel is very much uh, uh, active in several areas. First of all, habitat protection, restoration, and rewilding. And I'll come back to that because it's a major issue. We operate in a national network of bird observatories. The Jerusalem Bird Observatory is one. The Elat Bird Sanctuary is another. And we are about to open a couple others. And we also work with individuals who do bird ringing or banding, as you call it here, in several other parts of the country. We do a lot of research and monitoring. What's happening with the birds? Where are they? What the trends are so that we can understand what um, conservation we need to do. And of course, direct conservation. Uh, one of the things we've been successful in doing over the last few years is taking the turtle dove off of the hunting, the legal hunting list in Israel. Um, and we do a lot of uh, advocating for things like that. We're very much involved in the issue of renewable energy in Israel, and I'll talk about that in a minute as well, and uh, protecting areas, direct, directly uh, protecting areas that need conservation. And of course, one of my jobs, tourism education and outreach, both within Israel and around the world. So we have several different ways to, to attack the problem. Here you can see, the um, the green are the protected areas of Israel. And if you wanted to turn that around, the white is where the most hab habitation is, okay? Now, what's important to point out that um, of the 26% of the land that's protected, a lot of that land is also military uh, <laughs> is, uh, land. Um, people are not really allowed in there. You can't build, so they act as de facto sort of uh, bird, bird, bird uh, or nature conservation areas. But they do face some stress when the army is in there doing the army stuff. Okay, yeah. <laughs> we do not think that this is enough. Uh, certainly not when we get to twenty twenty five, when the population is probably going to increase in, in, uh, more. And what we're more mainly concerned about is this area here that there should be more uh, land put aside for protection. There is still open space, it's just not designated for protection. So one of our biggest projects right now is wetland restoration and rewilding. Um, a lot of the north of the country, anything that used to be a wetland was converted 60, 70 years ago into fish ponds and the water was diverted from the wetland into fish ponds and we grew a lot of fish, uh, gefilte fish, uh, as they say. Um, that's a joke, yes. Um, fish farming has become less and less and less economic. Um, we can import fish a lot cheaper than we can raise fish. So a lot of the people seem in the area, um, the villages, have started to, to stop with the raising of fish. So what do they do with the land? Well, you, see, you can see on the, the right there, um, solar panels, okay? Mm -hmm. So a lot of them are being paid good money by the companies to put solar panels in the old fish ponds. Mm -hmm. Now that's green, right? It's a green solution. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're, we're all for green energy, mm -hmm. however, to take a wetland that then became a fish pond and turning it into a dry um, solar panel farm doesn't seem the right direction to us, okay? Um, so we are trying to take those fish ponds and rewild them. Now, because the fish ponds took over the, the natural habitat, they became a focus point for the migrating birds. In fact, if you want to go see birds in Israel, we go to, to the fish ponds, okay? Um, so we really don't want to lose that wet habitat. So we have actually started a project called Startup Nature, 
uh, where we uh, acquiring fish ponds from the fish farmers at expense on our expense and rewilding them to create new wetlands for the migration of birds. And there's a, a lot of positivity to that. First of all, these wetlands fix carbon in a much better way than the fish ponds did or anything. It's, wetlands are one of the best ways to fix carbon. And they increase biodiversity and they provide the, the stop oversight for the birds. As opposed to the, you can see here a fish farm, all they've done is they've covered the water with uh, solar panels, but it's sterile and it's not good for anybody. You're reducing emissions, yes, you're creating green energy, but you uh, we have great biodiversity loss. Mm -hmm. So this is a unique opportunity that, that we are running to. We have started with two, um, two fish farms. This is our Startup Nature. Mm -hmm. Has anybody heard of Startup Nation? Okay, Israel is called the Startup Nation because of the number of startups and, and high-tech companies that's, that are founded there. So we just took that and twisted it a little bit for the Startup Nation. Okay. So our first one is in Kfar Rupin, which is on the border with Jordan. And we have taken uh, Nahal Amud or, or, or the Amud Reservoir. And uh, um, the last couple of years, we've been working to re-channel the river through the reservoir and to plant native species. The Jordan. The Jordan River, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, and to, um, to, to set up a, a series of, of boardwalks and bird hides for people to enjoy. And it's already uh, running. The, the birds have found the place wow. even before we finish the work. <laughs> so we have whiskered terns and little egrets and a speciality, the Dead Sea Sparrow, coming and using the site. And it should just get better because we haven't finished with the project yet. So we're expecting more and more. Our second one is in Magan Mikhail, which is on the coast. And it's a series of, this is a huge fish farming complex. We have taken, there's a river here, and we have taken all the area outlined in blue and are, are converting those into national, into uh, reconstructed wetlands. And the hope is that we'll get the rest of it as well. But um, one step at a time. Every dunam or acre that we adopt costs a lot of money because we have to compensate the kibbutz, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So we are starting small and building as we go. Like the Nature Conservancy model yeah. where mm -hmm. you just buy the land at market value. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You guys are familiar with this environmental yeah. mm -hmm. theory of change where you just buy yeah. the land. I, and then we, but we don't just buy it and leave it. We actually active, actively re deconstruct and then reconstruct the the wetland. And then there's there's going to be ongoing uh, management of the site mm -hmm. to make sure that it stays stays in the in the in the shape that we want it to be. Okay. Now what's interesting is this this has led to a cross border mm -hmm. uh, cooperation which we are big on in, in SBNI. This is um, General um, Mansour, and he's standing on the Jordanian side of the border at Kfarupin, mm -hmm. where they also have an old reservoir that drains off the Jordan River, mm -hmm. and they are starting to rewild this as well. So within the next couple of years, we will have reconstructed wetlands spanning the mm -hmm. border from Farupin into Jordan. And General Mansour has been a big friend of Israel when it comes to cooperation um, or about nature and conservation. Yeah. I just wanted to point out that given the um, tenuous status of relations right now between Israel and Jordan, that is technically like a very low profile thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you won't see a lot of published articles mm -hmm. about it because if it became public, then they would be forced to pull out. Right. So if you are saying, oh, well, why haven't we heard more about that? There's oftentimes a lot of great cross-border work that's happening on the ground that you don't hear about because if people heard about it, then the people in the fall would be forced to stop. Absolutely. Where government to government can't do or can't talk, 
NGO to NGO and birder people to, to people, we can do a lot on the ground. And birder to birder, we 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 are in contact with people from every country surrounding us and uh, talking about the issues and collaborating. And I'll show you some pictures in a little bit about that. I spent the last 20 something years at the Neely and David Jerusalem Bird Observatory. This, by the way, is the Knesset. And this is the Bird Observatory. Down here is the Supreme Court. And of this, the Parliament. The Parliament, yes. Um, we say that of all three, we're the most important. Um, of course. With, with definitely the most. Um, we do the most positive work. Yes, as a, we, we, we're the most relaxed of the three. We're here for um, two reasons. One is uh, strategic for the birds. The birds always use the hills of Jerusalem for migration. Mm -hmm. So we try to preserve some greenery within the middle of Jerusalem to be a hotspot for migration. And this is probably one of the best places to come to see certain species of birds during migration, like the olive tree warbler. Mm -hmm. um, the second is that we do active and passive lobbying with the Knesset. So SPNI has lobbyists on staff who spend an awful lot of time in that building, going from meeting to meeting and trying to make sure that the interests that we have around conservation are on the table at every time, every step of the way. We also do passive uh, lobbying. Uh, it's not unusual to see a member of Knesset sitting in our bird hide over here mm. and having an off off-site meeting or a breather. Um, we invite the, the kids of the staff of the Knesset, the, the, the permanent staff, to come for summer camps. The Knesset calls us every time there's a snake in the building, <laughs> um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of, uh, um, we, we were called in, the, the, the Knesset actually goes like seven or eight uh, floors underground, and there was a snake, a six foot snake, on the bottom floor <laughs> and we had to go in and rescue it and we released it on site. So we do a lot of collaboration and keep we keep SPNI in their minds all the time as much as we can. Our other big site is in Elat. Has anybody been there? Yeah, yeah. Um, this is a fantastic site that is trying to reconstruct the natural habitat, which was uh, what they call salt marsh. It looks nothing like the salt marsh here. It's uh, scrubby bushes, not uh, phragmites or whatever. Um, and this is the main stopover site for many of the birds that are coming into Israel in the spring and probably one of the best places to see migration anywhere in the world in March. Mm -hmm. And Lisa has had experience with this. Um, these two observatories act as hubs. This is where we can interact with people and do um, education, do outreach. We have monitoring, bird, bird banding going on and other monitoring that we can uh, involve people in so that education and, and research is going hand in hand. We help kids with their research projects that they have to do for school, et cetera, et cetera. And this community then goes out into the world and helps us with our conservation. So when we're fighting against the wind farms, we have a, a strong community that is working with us that say, okay, this is what we have to do. The picture. Okay. Yeah. She should be able to change the view so it disappears and that goes away too. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, you can kind of see the flamingos flying in there. Mm -hmm. There we go. Oh, you can cover up, yeah. cover up SPNI. Yeah. I also made it part of my work, and, and it's still ongoing to um, increase the diversity of people that are involved with SPNI and with Bird, Bird, uh, Bird Life Israel. Um, we start with kids at a very young age of all, all backgrounds and try to bring them in. And um, we do a lot of work trying to encourage uh, women to become more involved in, in science, like, like, like the team that Lisa was on. This is the first all women banding team that we had at the Bird Observatory. I'm really proud of it because here I can see one, two, three, four young women who all grew up at the Bird Observatory and started as kids and then became banders. 
So um, we, we're, we, we say at the Bird Observatory, we don't only, only catch birds, we catch kids. Yeah. <laughs> and we try to encourage them. And you can see that there's a multi-generational aspect to it as well, which is so fantastic to see a 14-year-old sitting down next to a 70-year-old mm -hmm. discussing birds together. Um, there's not a lot of places where that contact can be made. Mm -hmm. We also do a lot of uh, youth engagement and outreach, um, and we're trying to outreach also into the ultra orthodox and the um, the Arab communities that are underrepresented in any of our activities uh, for various reasons. We're at the moment trying to build more bird observatories. So we just we just uh, as I landed in Israel. I, I would send pictures that we're opening up the Ramat Hanadiv, Ramat Hanegev Birding Center in Stabokir. And then the two fish pond re, uh, mm -hmm. rewilding projects will have bird observatories there as well. Mm -hmm. And so we, we're expanding it into a national project. Mm -hmm. The Israel Bird Club is a great way to get adults involved. We run, we run walks and, and sessions uh, on a weekly basis throughout the year that people can participate in. And of course, we do a lot of monitoring. Um, we are we have professional staff that do professional monitoring. We get in, um, uh, volunteers involved. The, those of you who bird might use eBird, um, and we get people using eBird to do surveys and breeding bird surveys. And a lot of this goes into helping us figure out what the status of the birds is and where we need to put our energy and money for conservation. And so eBird has grown, I can't even tell you, since, since COVID started, the number of people that are using eBird in Israel, you can see that the, the height of the activity is in the center of the country, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, but the, and you can almost follow the roads, the main roads through the desert, but we're getting more and more information because of this eBird. Our conservation efforts are ongoing. We work with other branches of SPNI to make sure that we 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 um, are as effective as can be. Whether it's in stopping uh, hunting, in trying to push the green re renewable energy in the right direction, to fight the wind turbines on the big migration routes, which is a big issue in Israel, mm -hmm. and then just conservation of natural areas. Some of the areas that are at the most risk are actually designated as uh, agricultural. Mm -hmm. And so how do we make sure that we change the status or work with local uh, municipalities to make sure that they're uh, consumed? And we're also working with, um, with cities to make sure that we do urban wildlife mm -hmm. uh, conservation. Mm -hmm. And my big thing this year, this, since, since January is to increase the tourism. And that might seem like a strange thing, but the world is turning more and more to ecotourism. People want to feel like they're doing something mm -hmm. good with the money that they're spending on traveling. So we offer them that option. We work with tour companies that come to Israel. We offer our own festivals and there are uh, some, some flyers on the table to come and see the migrations in the key periods of, of the year. And all the money raised by these go straight back into our conservation uh, programs. And, and, and I should say that conservation, when I, uh, tourism, when, I, when, when we are asked to present numbers and we can say X number of tourists is spending X number of dollars coming to Kvaru Pim or Elat, this, um, this speaks to the powers that mm -hmm. be. They like, they like numbers and money. Mm -hmm. One of the other projects I'm involved in is building international co co uh, collaborations. So here you see a group of people. Um, they came from as far away as Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan mm -hmm. and uh, Azerbaijan, the Balkans and the Mediterranean, including Egypt, Jordan, and I can't say it loudly, but Palestine. Mm -hmm. um, and they came together and we spent a week together discussing uh, two different topics. One was the conservation of stopover sites on the migration flyway, and the other was um, how to create a community-based uh, uh, nature center. Some of these places are only at the beginning stages of trying to do this, so we are able to uh, give our expertise and also provide a place 
where cross uh, communication can happen. And this has already led to several collaborations that may not be involving us, but are involving the countries that are involved. And it's something that's ongoing and we hope to do more of it. I'm also supposed to, fingers crossed, represent uh, Israel once again at the International Bird Observatories Conference, which is something that Manamat has been part of for the last couple uh, times that it's happened, it got canceled because of COVID. Um, and this is a time, this is a place where bird observatories from around the world can come together and discuss some of the issues that we have, solutions, collaborations, and so forth. And this year it's in Mexico, so looking forward to that one, I hope. The last project that Lisa, uh, this is the big one for, uh, for, for the two of us, is Champions of the Flyway. And as you, as she, as Lisa mentioned, it's a bird race, which a lot of people go, what? What, you race birds? No, <laughs> it's a 24 hour race with teams from around the world. You have to have three or four people on your team, race around the Southern part of Israel and try to find as many species of birds as you can in one day. And it's pretty crazy. Um, but that's just the fun part. The other part of that is each of these teams is raising money for a specific project and that all the money goes towards this project that uh, is supporting conservation. And then the last, this year in, in March will be the 10th year. So we've done this for nine years now. We've raised over $500,000 for conservation. And um, I think this was, what we can see here was uh, Batumi in Georgia. And every year we chose a different project, a different area where the money was gonna go. And it's usually a bird that we see in Israel, but not always, some, some project that they need help. And this year, um, oh, this is, we, we've had over 500 people involved from 34 countries, so it's a pretty, a pretty big uh, thing. It's become known as the Dakar of bird races, um, and it's a lot of fun. And of course, Lisa and I have been for the last three champions, part of um, Women in Step. Unfortunately, 2020, right as we were getting on the plane practically, oh, okay. The countries were shut down because of COVID, uh, but we still won the prizes for fundraising that year. I think we won two prizes that year, two trophies. Yeah. And um, then last year and this year, we were able to race. We also won the fundraising trophy two years in a row. I think we have the most trophies of any team in the history of, uh, <laughs> hey. but we have retired. Uh, it'll be a new constellation next oh. year. Um, so this is uh, Lydia, myself, uh, Patricia, Lisa, Amy, and Hannah. Um, six women squeezed in a car, racing around the country. <laughs> and I forget how many species we saw, 130, something like that. 131. 131. But we did, we had a great time and we survived and nobody killed each other. Yeah. <laughs> and this year, we're going to be raising money for Tanzania. Uh, specifically for the white stork, which migrates from Northern Europe all the way down into Africa. There's a lot of conservation work done in Europe, a lot of conservation done in Israel for this bird, but they go to Africa and tens of thousands are killed every season, mostly for food. These birds are going into areas where people do not have enough to eat. They're very poor. So we are raising money to try to counter this, but it needs to be done very sen with sensitivity. We can't just go in and say, stop hunting and not give them an alternative. So some of the money that we raise is going to be used to create alternative um, sources of income, um, including things like beekeeping and pig keeping and chicken raising, mm -hmm. and also hiring the, the poachers to become tour guides and researchers <laughs> and so that they will get money from that. And this stalk, you see the spear in him? Mm -hmm. That was filmed in Israel. Mm -hmm. It's an African spear. He managed to mm -hmm. cross the desert, uh -huh. get to Israel with the spear uh, stuck mm -hmm. in his body. Was he um, saved? We were not able to catch him. He left. Oh. As far as I know, he, he he. We haven't had a report of him showing up in Europe, so we're not either. He's in an area where people are not obs uh, observing, 
or he didn't make the ongoing journey. But it's not the first one. We've had a couple over the years, a couple. In fact, the history of bird ringing started with a bird like this. Many, many decades ago, 100 years ago or more, we still didn't understand the passage of migration. Where do birds go on migration? This must have been a, a few hundred years ago now. The first evidence that birds actually went to maybe a different country was a stalk that came back with an arrow in it. And people started to think, ah, they're not going to the moon, mm -hmm. which is one, <laughs> well, was one theory, or they're not going into the bottom of a lake mm -hmm. and hibernating for the winter, which was another theory, Gosh. or changing into another species, which was a third theory. Maybe they're going somewhere else. And as we started to travel, we started to recognize the birds from Europe in Africa and started to understand that there was seasonal work going on, so seasonal migration. So that is our project for this year. And uh, I'll just leave you with um, with this message that Yossi Lashem uh, lent me. And that is, if you want to run fast, run alone. But if you want to run far, run together. And that's what this is all about, collaborating and involving as many of you in our project as possible. So thank you very much. That's all I have for you. If you have any questions, I'm happy to. So we, we do have a question that sort of saw from the Zoom chat from Julie. So you touched on, I talked about bird hunting. Um, how big of a problem is bird hunting in Israel and what birds are most hunted? So it's, it's among um, Jewish Israelis, hunting is really not an issue. It's not part of the culture. Um, the Arabs do hunt. And mostly they're hunting things like ducks and pigeons. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, many can't identify the difference between a pigeon and let's say a, a turtle dove, which is a endangered species. So we have managed to remove the turtle dove from the list of possible species that you can hunt, but it now becomes an education process to try to make sure people can tell the difference uh, because I'm not sure that many can. Apart from that, it's not really an issue. However, in the surrounding areas, including the Gaza Strip, Egypt, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, um, hunting of migratory birds is very, very prevalent, as is the rest of the Mediterranean. So Malta, Greece, Cyprus, France, migrating birds are still hunted, many of, it, many of them illegally. Some of it just for the fun of it or for the culture. Um, and many, many places are trying to, to combat this, uh, this uh, problem. And we, and we estimate that, you know, several million birds are hunted every year. Yeah, it's, it can be quite an issue. There was a bird I wanted to slide, but I wanted to know if you could identify it, if you're willing to go back. A bird, you know this one, barn owl. Yeah. Tell me when you see it. Yeah. Which one? On the top. The top. Um, it's one of the warblers, the desert warbler, mm -hmm. I think. Spectacle warbler. Can't quite see it. And the next one. It's the an next eagle. slide. The next slide is a is a wheat ear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is a wheat ear. Wheat ear. It's a, that, that's a specialty. There are how many species of wheat ears? 10? Something like that. Quite a few species of wheat ears, and it's uh, something that, bird, that uh, birders come to Israel to see is, all the, is the wheat ear family. <laughs> Anyone else? How? All right, let me see. <laughs> Okay, so the one on the right is a Fubara or a McQueen's Busted. It's a, a turkey-sized bird, maybe the female turkey. And one of the things about it, it it's, um, it's an endangered species, lives in scrublands in the desert. It's hunted all over the Middle East by um, people using falcons to hunt them. And... We have a nice population in Israel that are doing pretty well, 
this is a male. The 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 fun thing about you've seen these, right? Is that when they're um when they're mating, when they're trying to attract a mate, they run, they kind of clear an area of, of land of big stones and stuff like that. And they run around dancing. They literally throw their heads back. These feathers here fluff up like a big powder puff. They throw their heads back so they can't see where they're going and they start running around. Um, and this attracts the female. So it's it's a uh, it's something that people want to see a lot. And these are the cranes, the common cranes. We get them coming down into Israel for the winter. Um, there can be forty to sixty thousand common cranes oh at the Hula Valley during the winter. So that's a a, a great place to go to see them. What's and, their habitat in the north? Uh, wetlands. So we have a restored wetland at the Hula Lake. Now where are they coming from? Oh, northern northern Europe and 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 Asia. Yeah, they like almost tundra type uh, uh, areas. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the use of or the impact of the rodent poisons um, in Africa and farmers using them and then what that means for the cultures and so so po not just rodent poisoning. So so poisoning is a major issue. It's also a major issue with our griffin vultures in Israel. Uh, farmers will put out a poisoned coat goat to try to kill the jackals or wolves that are pestering their livestock. And what tends to eat them are the, are the um, vultures who then die almost immediately. And we've had several big die-offs because of uh, these poisons. In Africa, they also do poisoning for, for, for a variety of reasons. So one of the things I learned about this year in Tanzania, they will poison water to try to catch birds for oh, food, oh. but then they're eating the food. And so it's actually a, 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 a health hazard. And it's one of the reasons, one of the things they're trying to combat. So that's one layer of poisoning. The other layer of poisoning is um, vultures, circle dead animals okay mm -hmm. so if you were a poacher trying to poach an elephant or something mm -hmm. the vultures are going to give you a weight to the to the police mm -hmm. so first you put out a poisoned animal the vultures die and then you go in and you poach the area okay because now there's no more sentinels to tell you what's going on mm -hmm. um the the last photograph i had here of the of the owls we use owls in Israel for biological pest control. So instead of putting down mm -hmm. pesticides, because there are a lot of little voles in the fields, you put up a couple nest That's boxes. Cool. And one of these one of these families will eat thousands of voles in a nesting season, depending on how many chicks they have. Mm -hmm. And if you put up a nest box for owls during the, day, during the hunt at night, and a nest box for the Eurasian kestrel that nests once in the day, you got yourself covered. And we now have uh, thousands of nest boxes all over the country. And we collaborate again through General Mansour. In Jordan, they've put up at least 300 nest boxes there. And we're now working with, with um, Dubai and Monaco and Greece and Switzerland. And it's spreading. Yossi Leshem, Dr. Lucy Leshem says that the barn owl is now the new new bird of peace. Yeah. Forget about the dove. <laughs> um, but but we can in, instead of poisoning our birds, we can use them to um, to help with pest control. And is there a place in Israel, kind of northern, where carrion that's safe are put out for some? Of yes, the in in the Negev, we we do put out. Uh, we have a couple feeding stations for the vultures. Uh, some of them are kept secret, so people can't go there. Mm -hmm. And there's one or two that you can view from sort of across the valley. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, does, it is helpful. The, the vultures, like the California condor, can't really survive in the wild by themselves. Mm -hmm. They need help. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems in the, in, the, the, in the Golan Heights, there's a lot of areas that still have active mines. Mm -hmm. And there's cattle. And the cattle once in a while get blown up by a mine. The vultures come and eat the the carrion, but they also eat the the shrapnel, which has lead. 
And this, this is one of the reasons that the population in the north has suffered. So it's not outright poisoning, but the lead poisoning has caused the, the eggs to be too thin and the, the chicks don't survive and so on. Give a picture of the weekend gentlemen that we I don't. I know I didn't put it up. I'll have to fix my my presentation. We do have another question from Julie. What effect is climate change having on the habitat in Israel? So there's the direct um effect of less less rain and more rain in some areas and overall strange behavior of the weather, which is happening here, which we haven't quite figured out what's gonna happen yet. Uh, we had rain in June this year, which we I don't remember ever having like solid rain in June, usually by March it's done. Um, there's been ongoing drought as well. So we, we, we know that things are happening, but as yet the, the direct effect is a little hard to pinpoint. We know it's going to affect us, but we haven't quite but when we're talking about migrating birds, if we go back to the way in the beginning, to the map, so birds migrate from the north to the south um, because it gets cold. They leave the, the, the north because it gets cold. When it gets cold, there's less insects and less fruit, and you might get ice and snow, so it's not so hospitable. So let's go south to South America or to Africa. So they're doing that based on external cues such as weather, okay? Mm -hmm. But when they're in Africa, how do they know when it's time to come back? What they're usually using as a cue is the length of day, even though the length of day in, in, in equatorial Africa may not be that different, it's still different enough that it's used as a cue. Mm -hmm. So they start heading back and they're sticking to the timetable. But one of the things we've learned up here in, uh, um, in Wisconsin, they have over a hundred years of phenology data um, that shows that, that winter or spring is arriving up to two weeks early than before, okay? Now what happens, these birds are, are timing their migration to get to the north, mm -hmm to be there when the food they need to feed the chicks is at its prime. If they arrive two weeks later, that food may have already decreased in number. And if there's less food, there's less nest success and, and less chicks and the population declines. So that's one serious issue that is very difficult to fix that. How do you tell the birds to, okay, go now, okay? <laughs> The second issue is that this area, the Sahara and the, the Sahara, which is the, the scrub area to the south, is getting bigger. And that's that's climate change. So the distance they have to travel over the, the area with no food gets bigger and bigger. And then the birds are arriving in Israel in bad shape. Some of them are not even getting there. And we see, we're, all across the board, we're seeing popul populations mm -hmm. seriously decline. Okay, and we just we, we're expecting more. Now, the interesting thing is certain populations of birds, certain species seem to be changing their migration pattern here or their strategies. More and more birds are staying in Israel, not going over, not huge numbers, but enough that if they survive and, and then survive to raise chicks because they're they're migrating back a little earlier, then maybe the population can evolve. So one that doesn't migrate as much, but that's a long-term process. So we don't really know where that's going yet. Yeah. Does Israeli government support you in any way whatsoever? <laughs> Why do you look at me? <laughs> no, because we're just having this conversation. So this particular government is not very supportive. Um, other governments have been, some, some are more, some are less. Uh, it really depends who, who you're talking to and what the issues are. Um, SPNI does not get a lot of direct funding from uh, the government except for education. Okay, we do get a uh, mandate to do nature education and that, that goes up and down, but we do a lot of our education work through them. Okay, and so that money does come in through that, which then gets filtered 
into lobbying or conservation mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah. I think we should say, though, at this point, that SPNI, the Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel, is the largest environmental organization in Israel. It was started in 1953, celebrating its 70th anniversary. It's the longest term, uh, longest, mm -hmm. oldest, uh, most veteran environmental organization. I'm the biggest. And, and by far, in a way, the biggest. Like I yes. was explaining this morning to the people on the bird walk, it's like a combination of Sierra Club because it leads all the hikes and, mm -hmm. and marks all the trails and Nature, nature Conservancy because it buys land mm -hmm. for conservation mm -hmm. and Audubon mm -hmm. Society and uh -huh. NRDC and, 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 right? Mm -hmm. It's like every environmental organization that you can think of sort of in one. And so it is very big. It does have a very large budget and it does for the educational programs that it provides all of the um, environmental education programs throughout all of the school systems in Israel. That is, at least until today, still a yeah. line item yeah. in the budget. Yeah. Um, but um, the other thing that I think is worth mentioning here in terms of um, communication vis-a-vis -vis the government is that um, SPNI does a huge amount of environmental advocacy. So mm -hmm. if anyone's paying attention to the news right now, to understand that every environmental organization in Israel, including SPNI, has been in opposition to the changes that are proposed right now. Because every environmental organization needs to be able to use the Supreme Court and the court system to prevent development. Mm -hmm. Anytime that you have politicians that are, mm -hmm. you know, work in tandem with private industry, mm -hmm. you're at risk of losing protected spaces or conservation to yeah. develop. So it's just very, very important. Uh, SPNI, along with all environmental organizations in Israel. Yeah, are. we act as a very serious watchdog. And we have to keep in mind, you know, we have a history. We have a prime minister who went to jail because of bribery uh, concerning a development program project in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And so um, the current prime minister is... I'm not talking about the current prime minister until, until there's a court case. And, uh, but Almer did go to jail for, for corruption mm -hmm. specifically because of a, a, a or connected with the development project. So we know that we have to mm -hmm. be aware of everything that's going mm -hmm. on. We can't fight every project, but we can make sure that environmental concerns are being addressed with every project and and keep the government on track. And so we do a lot of that that, that kind of work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you mention the Gazelle Valley? I know it was a yeah, so I didn't put it in like So the Gazelle Valley Park is another project of uh, SPNI inside Jerusalem. Um, and it's a very interesting project because um, there's a valley inside inside Jerusalem that used to be uh, farmed by one by the kibbutzim, they made they they grew apples and plums and stuff like that until it became feasible economically not viable to do so in the city, and so this piece of land left was sat unused for several years, a couple decades, and there was a herd of gazelles that got trapped. They used to have free access to the outside, but then we built a road here and a mall here and a <laughs> stadium here, and they got trapped. And um and lane intersection. Yeah, it, it was not easy to get across that hill. Um one day the residents woke up and there was bulldozers in the valley and they said, wait a second, what's going on? And apparently the kibbutzim had decided that they could build, I think it was six thousand apartments oh, in this valley. Um there was no at that point there had not been the the usual process of, of announcing and and you could you could give feedback and you know the whole process of development. So they fought back and they got the project stayed because the kibbutzim only had permission to do agriculture on this piece of land. And once they didn't do agriculture, it reverted to the state. So they were able to stop. Then they realized we can keep doing this one project after the other. Mm -hmm. And to us, it's important to preserve the gazelles and to preserve some green space in the city. So they contacted SPNI and said, what can we do? And they formed a citizen coalition of, of residents from the area, sat down with SPNI. And I believe that the person who designed um, or the designers of Central Park mm -hmm. 
and, mm -hmm. and came up with a plan for the valley, a development plan which involved trails and seating areas and picnic areas for people mm -hmm. on one half of the valley, and on the other half of the valley was set aside only for the gazelles. And it also involved what's it, what we call a rainfall capture program. Mm -hmm. So what, what used to happen is it would rain, it would fall on all the asphalt, it mm -hmm. would flow through the valley and <laughs> would flood the streets and it would go on down to the, the ocean. So instead of doing that, we have five ponds which capture the water as it comes in. They're wetlands, so the wetlands swell like sponges and soak up the water. Yeah. The yeah, um see yeah the habitat was increased mm -hmm. biodiversity was increased okay. floods were stopped okay. and the groundwater underneath the valley started to fill up okay. again and it's it's considered to be one of the best ground or uh, flood control projects in Israel people are trying to copy it around the world mm -hmm. so they produced this program took it to the state and they won. Uh -huh. which is the first time citizens have won a development program like this. And the mayor at the time decided that it was uh, a good idea to make this a, um, a city park. It was a very political move on his part, but it works for us. So he put in, the city put in several million dollars to design the park, fix up, fix up the park, provide facilities. It's now run as a city park by SPNI. Right. We we run it. We we keep track of the gazelles. We keep track of the visitors. Provide education, okay. and so on. And so it's a it's a world world winning uh, project. And if you ever come to Jerusalem, I'll be happy to show you around. And I'm passing around a photo, which is not an expert photo. The reason I took this photo is that you can see how it's in the middle of the city, right? You can see these like different highway signs, and it, and if you like zoom in right there, there's like gazelle in front of the like this way to the mall. Mom, you can sit at the bus stop on, on Soman Park and the, the, the bells will be right behind you. In fact, in the last snowstorm we had, the gazelles, went, when, when it snows, then they get cold. What they do is they start to run. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so they start like, there's uh, we, when we opened the park eight years ago, there were four gazelles left. There are now over a hundred. <laughs> and we have started to trap them and release them into wild areas outside Jerusalem where they're they're endangered. So there are 100, but they've probably been close to 200 gazelles born in the valley so far. So you have, you know, 100 gazelles running around the valley and everybody who lives around has to photograph it. And I get like 20, 30 different videos sent to me. And then each one of them is sent to me about 100 times. It's like enough with the gazelles are ready. But gazelles are cute and sexy and they're very, very popular. And Jerusalem loves its gazelles. So um, they're there to stay. It would be very hard for the city of Jerusalem to take the park away from the residents now. Um, because it's been such a success. The Gazelle Valley Park. Gazelle Valley Park. Um, and not only that, but there's a species of duck called the ferruginous duck, which is a, a endangered species that a few years ago they showed up in the pond and then they bred and they had babies. And so now we're considering making this a Ramsar, Ramsar site, um, which, will, which will solidify its uh, place in, uh, uh, in conservation. <laughs> So all these little little uh, victories go a long way. So any how many other, people? Any other birds of note that have also started to appear in the, the numbers in there? That twitch where all the birders came to see this little brown bird that nobody was a bird or cared about. Which one? <laughs> <laughs> It happened that, that we, we get a lot of vagrants coming through, um, including some American birds have come through that, um, you know, just like, I don't know if, how many people are birders here? So you've heard of the mountain plover over on in Sandwich. So the same situation there, I went there and how did I find the bird? I, I found the bird watchers first. Um, it, it, you can't keep it a secret. Uh -huh. Could you talk about what kind of social media or website stuff you guys have? So, so we have a website for BirdLife Israel. Um, 
think I might have caught it at the end. Yeah, it was at the end. Yeah. Um, the mind the Do we have a sign up sheet? I want to. Yeah. And so, I'm Bird Life Israel, if you just plug that in, you'll find us. Um, we're also um, very active on, is it still called Twitter? Yeah. Um, no. Or the X, X, no. The X, whatever. As, as long as, and until we figure out a different a different place to be, um, and uh, we do have some Instagram uh, um, uh, exposure as well, and and, and a website. And also, as I has a Facebook page yeah. that you can follow there, and, and so does Nature yeah. Israel. Which we're the same. We have the same. You don't Nature have a Israel. second. No. Okay. We have the same Facebook page and. Um, and there's Bird Life Israel has one as well. Yeah. That we have, and there's also um, SPNI has webinars every Sunday. Len is sometimes. Oh, every Sunday. other, I think. Every other yeah. Sunday, yeah. right. With yeah. different um, bird experts and other environmentalists and ecologists and conservationists and experts. Yes, on, on, on October 8th, we'll be doing our next live birding webinar where we send birders out into the field with telescopes and, and mm -hmm. um, phones, and we bounce from place to place and see what's going on. And that's a lot of fun. So do you want to give another round of applause to Thank you all for coming. Um, we're coming up. There are some flyers here in case you want to grab one.